Hi everyone, so in the first part of this lecture we looked at the motivation problem of calculus, the area problem, and we managed to work out what the area is under a quadratic curve, y equals x squared, over the interval from 0 to 3 using this process of slicing it up into intervals, approximating the area under the curve on each interval by a rectangle, and then looking at the limit of this process as the number of rectangles went to infinity, or another way to think about it, as the, the width of the individual rectangles went to zero. I just want to summarize this process now. So here is the process. We started with a function f, and it was continuous on some interval a to b. In our particular case, f was the squaring function, and the interval was zero to three, but now we're going to look at a more general situation. We slice up that interval into n subintervals. If our original interval had length, b minus a, then the width of each subinterval would be b minus a over n because we've sliced it up into n equal width subintervals. So here's the picture down below. There's all of our uh, intervals and our x values. So this would have been x sub, I'll change the color here. This would have been x sub 1, this is x sub 2, x sub 3, and so on. Now, what are the values of these? endpoints of the intervals? Well, x sub 0 is a. What's the value of the next one? Well, we just have to jump over delta x to get to it. So I'm starting at a, and I jump over 1 delta x to get to x1. So it's a plus delta x. How do I get to x2? I just have to jump over another delta x. So x2 would be a plus 2 delta x's, and so on. I just have to keep jumping over a width of delta x to get to the next one. So I'm just adding a delta x to each of the previous xi values. And now we came up with this idea of approximating each of these slices with a rectangle. We use the right-hand endpoint. So if I'm using the right-hand endpoint on each case, sometimes the right-hand endpoint will give us a height of a rectangle that sits above the curve on the interval. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll give us a height that sits below it. So we can definitively say that the right-hand um, sum is always bigger than the actual value under the, the curve. In our last example, the squaring function, it was just because the function was increasing that we had this property of the right-hand being the upper bound and the left-hand sum being the lower bound. But it doesn't happen that way in general. The function could oscillate around. And we can't judge whether which, which one's bigger or not. Um, in general, we just have to look on the specific interval. So what do we have? Well. For the i-th slice, well, maybe I'll say the area of the i-th slice. So the area of the i-th slice under the curve. So what do I mean by i-th slice? So we've just sliced up the interval. And consequently, we sliced up the region under the curve. So here is the i-th slice. It's the one that has the right-hand endpoint x sub i. Just like the first slice has right-hand endpoint x1, second slice has right-hand endpoint x2, third slice x, right-hand endpoint x3. The i slice would be this one here. So this would be the area of the i slice. It would be this region here, the area actually under the curve. The area actually under the curve is approximately the area of the rectangle that we're using to approximate that slice. In this case, we're using the right-hand endpoint, so it's approximately the base times the height of the rectangle. The height, we're using the right-hand endpoint, so this is where that comes in. We're using the right-hand endpoint to compute the height, so it's the function value at x sub i. That's the area of the i slice. And if we add up all of these rectangles, the area of these rectangles using the right side, then we get a rough approximation of the actual area under the curve. And so that's what this is up here. Rn is just the sum of the areas of each rectangle. Rectangle 1, rectangle 2, all the way up to the very last rectangle. They all have factors of delta x in common because we took these equal width intervals. So I can factor out the delta x, and I get that it's f of x1 plus all the way up to f of xn. Now if you think back to the example we did, that's exactly what we saw. We had a delta x out front, and we had these f of xi's 
all squared. Uh, the, sorry, these xi's all squared because the function we were dealing with was the squaring function. So this is now just the general formulation of that. Now, we're ready to find what we mean by an area. What is an area? The area, here we go, the area of the region S that lies under the graph of a continuous function over an interval AB is the limit of the sums of the areas of the approximating rectangles. So we're using the area of the rectangle as the basis for what we're defining area to be in general. Area is defined to be this limiting process of approximating with rectangles and then refining your approximations so they get better and better and better by taking the number of rectangles going to infinity. So that is, area is defined to be this, proce this limiting process. In other words, the limit as n goes to infinity of the width delta x times the heights of each of those rectangles, which we computed the heights using the right-hand endpoints. Uh, just, just so um, you think about this, what if we had ln here? ln, instead of the right-hand endpoints, we were using the left-hand endpoints. What would change? Well, the only part that would change would be where we start taking the heights from. Instead of using the right-hand endpoint, we're using the left-hand endpoint. So for the first interval, I wouldn't start by taking f of x1, because that's the right-hand endpoint of the first interval. I'd use f of x0. So all that would happen is that one would change to a 0, this would change to a 1. There'd just be this sideways shift, this, this shift of everything to the left. I'd go from x sub 0 up to x sub n minus 1. That's the only change that happens when I use the left-hand endpoints. x sub 0 up to x sub n minus 1. Now this is a sum that we see so frequently in this course that we're going to use it again and again and again that it's nice to have a compact notation for it, which is known as sigma notation. So what is sigma notation? Sigma notation says, okay, you've got this sum, and there's really not much difference between the terms. f of x1, f of x2, it's really the same thing that's happening to each term, except that there's this index change. So I can capture this by using sigma notation that's saying it's really, it's just a bunch of terms of the form x sub xi, or f of x sub xi. It's just a bunch of terms that look like this that you're adding together. So we use this capital sigma, uh, corresponding, you know, it's a Greek letter corresponding to our capital S if you want to think of it that way. S is the first letter in the word sum. So that's where the, this is coming from, capital sigma. So this is meaning sum of these f sub xi's. Now we have to tell it what the i's have to range over. Well, i is supposed to start at 1 and go all the way up to n. So this is just a compact notation for this sum here. And so that means that we can write the definition of area as this limit using these Riemann sums. So there is our condensed version of the definition of area. We've defined area now. We think back to the first uh, part of the lecture, we looked at all these definitions of area, we came to one that seemed to be the best sort of ca uh, best uh, intuitive idea of what area is that we were trying to capture. Area is a physical quantity expressing the size or part of a surface. Problem is that that doesn't tell us how to compute area. We want a definition that in some sense tells us what area is and how to compute it. And that's what we've got now. We've got a definition which ties into it how to compute an area. It's the limit of this process. It's the limiting value of this process of covering it with rectangles. So let's look at an example. We're going to find the area under this graph over the interval from 1 to 5. So let's just get a rough idea of what this graph looks like. It's a quadratic parabola opening downwards because of the negative 3 starts up here at 100, sweeps down. I'm only interested on the interval from 1 to 5, so 1 somewhere about here. 5, well I need to know is 5 to the left of the root or to the right of the root. I, I don't really need to know what the root is to do this, but if I just pop 5 in I see that 5 squared is 25 times 3 is 75, 100 minus 75, that's 25, so I know I'm over here. And that's going to be 525. And this height here, that's 1 and 97. 
So there's the region we want to compute the area of. From 1 all the way up to 5. And we're going to use our process of slicing and approximating each slice. So I'm just going to look at an arbitrary slice here, what we'll call the ith slice. There's our ith slice. The endpoints of our ith slice are the right-hand endpoint is xi, the left one would therefore be x sub i minus 1. What's the width of the ith slice? That's delta x. What's the width of this slice? Well, we took an interval of length. What well, goes from 1 to 5? So an interval of length 4, and we divided it into n equal size pieces. So the width is 4 over n. What is the value of the ith endpoint? Well, we start at 1, that's x sub 0, and to get to x sub 1, we'd add delta x. To get to x sub 2, we'd add delta x again. We keep adding delta x until we get to xi, and so we'd add i delta x's to get there. Well, in other words, it's 1 plus 4i by n. So there's what our x sub i is. And there's what our delta x is. And that's all the ingredients we need. So what is the area? The area is the limiting value of the sum of the areas of all these rectangles of, uh, on the corresponding slice. So it was delta x times the sum of i equals 1 to n of f, that's 100, minus 3, times xi squared. xi is 1 plus 4i by n squared. And so that's the sum that we have to work out the value of the limit at. I can do one more thing to just, actually I won't need to write it on a new line. I'm just going to erase it here. You could either write it on a new line or just erase and rewrite. Delta x was 4 over n, so I can just write 4 over n there. That's the thing we want to compute the limit of. Now at this point, it's just going to be pure algebraic manipulation up until the point in time where we're going to comp compute the limit. So algebraic manipulation involving sigma notation, okay, that the, the key here is that the sigma notation just means a, a, this elongated sum. So really, we're going to use no other properties other than just properties of addition to deal with that. But it might be the first time you're using sigma notation, so you might want to ap appeal to Appendix E in the textbook, in James Stewart's calculus textbook. Um, in Appendix E, they, or he goes through sigma notation and looks at some of the basic properties. And, and basically every property I'm going to use with sigma notation. I'll explain it here, but it's, it's shown in more details in Appendix E. So you'll want to refer to that. So what do we have? Well, we've got 4 over n, the sum of these things. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand out this square here. So that's minus 3. That's 1. So that's 1 times 1 squared. And then I get these cross terms of 1 times a 4i over n, and then I get a 4i over n times 1, so there'd be two of those, so that's an 8i over n, and then I get a 4i over n all squared, so that would be a 16i squared over n squared. I'm not dealing with the sigma notation yet, I'm just working out an alternate form for what the expression is that is being summed. So that's a 100 minus 3 minus 24i over n. Actually, the 100 minus 3, I'm just going to rewrite as a 97. Might as well simplify it now. 3 times 16, that's 48. So that's a minus 48i squared over n squared. And now I'm going to use the distributive property. Remember, this is just a sum of a bunch of things that uh, look like this, 97 minus blah, blah, blah. It's just a sum of a bunch of those things over and over and over again, a, bunch of, a sum of a bunch of them. And I'm multiplying that sum by 4 over n. Well, we have the distributive property that says if you multiply a sum of things by 
some number, I could just multiply it to each of the individual terms and then add the result. So I can bring this 4 over n and multiply it into the sum. And that's a property, of, a distributive property of multiplication over addition, but um, it might look a little bit strange because we're using sigma notation as well here. So again, appeal to appendix E if, if any of this is bothering you. 4 times 97, that's 388 over n. So 4 times 24, so that's minus 96i over n squared. And then we have a 4 times 48, which is 192i squared over n squared. So now at this point, I'm ready to deal with the sigma notation here. And here's the thing. It's just a sum. So it's saying, if I add this term, to another one like it, where the i value is now just increased by one in value, to another one, to another one. I'm really just staring at a sum that looks like this. I've got a plus b plus c, and then I'm adding to that another three things, e plus f plus g, and then adding to that another three things, dot, 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 and then another three things, etc. But I can rearrange the order in which I sum. I could add that one to that one to that one and group all of those ones together first and then add the middle ones of everything and then add the last ones to everything. So I can regroup. I can rearrange this sum and regroup them. So I'm just going to get rid of that and do the regrouping. What's the regrouping? Well, I could add together all of the things of the form 388 over n from 1 to n. Then I could add together all of the things of the form 96i over n squared from 1 to n, and then I could add together all of the things of the form negative 192i squared over n squared, where i equals 1 to n. So I've just rearranged the terms of the sum. Now, what can I do? Well, if we think about this, what am I do adding here? I'm adding 388 over n to 388 over n. Notice there's no i in this expression, so nothing's actually changing. The terms aren't actually changing. It's always 388 over n, and I'm adding it to itself n times. So if I add 388 over n to itself n times, it's just 388 over n times n. In the next sum, I've got this 90, negative 96 over n squared in front of every term that I'm adding. So I could factor that out. I could factor that out, negative 96 over n squared, and then I'm just left adding a bunch of things of the form i equals 1 to n of i. So this would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way up to plus n. Right, when I write it, this, this notation is shorthand for take whatever expression is here, plug the first number in the lower limit of this, or the lower number in this sum, and then do the next one, the next number, the next number. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to n, and just add those numbers up. So I can do the same thing here. 192, sum of i equals 1 to n of i squared, and I can factor out that n squared. And so there we go. So now we've boiled down this expression involving the limit, where everywhere the sum appears, it appears in these forms. And these have condensed forms. These are things that we're going to look at in the next lecture, um, how to get these condensed forms for or closed forms for these expressions. But this one is equivalent to n times n plus 1 over 2. And this one, as we've seen, is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all over 6. So those are closed form expressions. We'll actually work out the details of why these are the closed form expressions in the next lecture. But now I'm just going to use them here. Okay, so now this is the limit as n goes to infinity, 388 minus 96 times n times n plus 1 all over 2n squared 
minus 192 times n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6n. Oh, I just noticed a mistake that has trickled its way all the way down to here. If we go back, you probably caught this a while ago. When I multiplied the 4 over n into each one, so I had 4 over n times 97, that was correct. 4 over n times 24i over n, that was correct. It gave me the n squared. 4 over n times this expression, that should have been an n cubed here. That should be n cubed in the denominator. And that would be an n cubed there. And then we have an n cubed here, which is now trickled all the way down to there's our n cubed. So there's our n cubed in the denominator. Now we're going to compute the limit. How did I know there was a mistake there? Well, remember, when we're going to compute these limits, um, the way we compute the limit of the rational function is the degree of the numerator and the denominator are going to have to be the same. And then we look at the ratio of the leading coefficients. And this, in these kinds of examples where we're doing these Riemann sums, this often is the case that we end up getting down to a stage where we're looking at the limit of a rational function, especially when we're dealing with limit uh, areas under these quadratics or, or polynomial type curves. Um, so what is the value of the limit? Well, the first one is 388. The value of the next one is the ratio of their leading coefficients. So that's 96 is the leading coefficient on the top. Leading coefficient on the bottom is 2. So this is uh, 48. And the next one is 192 times 2 divided by 6. Leading coefficient is 192 with that other 2 there. Leading coefficient on the bottom is 6. So this is then 388 minus 48 minus 64 or 276. And so there is the area under the curve on the interval we are interested in. Okay. So again, um, I, I, I do want to emphasize the fact that we're working with the definition of area at this point. And the definition is the limiting value of these, what we're calling Riemann sums, using rectangles to approximate the area, and then taking the limit as the number of rectangles go to infinity. Much the same way when we first started doing derivatives, the way we computed a derivative was by looking at the limiting value of the difference quotient, or if you want to think of it as the slope of the secant line through two points. It might, you know, it, it's tedious. It, it may have been something that you didn't enjoy very much, and not often do people enjoy these sort of tedious calculations. Um, the point is, is that, much like in Calculus 1, where we had that definition, which was really important, the computations, they got rather tedious, and then we found new ways of doing those calculations using differentiation rules. The same thing's going to happen here. We need this definition for an area, this limit of these Riemann sums. That's really important. Calculating areas, we're going to do a few basic examples just to get our feet wet. And these calculations you'll see can be tedious at times. But hopefully, soon enough, we will start to see that there is a connection with differentiation and we'll see quicker methods for computing areas under curves over regions. That an example like this will take one line, two lines, depending on how big you write, um, to do the calculation using our connection with uh, differentiation. Whereas using the definition, it took quite a few more than, than two lines. So there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel if you want to think of it that way. We're going to see quick methods for computing areas. But it is important to get this definition down, to get your feet wet with it, to do some of these calculations to sort of feel how things work. Because starting to make this connection with calculus is a part of the definition of the integral. And we're going to have to investigate that a little bit more thoroughly. And so having your hands uh, get a little dirty with calculations is a good thing at this point.